Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us again here on Aspiration Inspiration with me, Jason George. As always, we aspire to inspire before we expire. And today we have another formidable guest with us, uh, the formidable, the, you know, illustrious, I should say, um, Dr. Simone Peters. Dr. Simone, thank you so much for joining us today. And thank you for having me today, Jason. Uh, it's indeed an honor and a privilege. So, I mean, we, the, the, the media has been buzzing with your, your recent, your most recent achievement that you obtained your PhD um, a degree at the University of Cape Town. How are you feeling about that achievement? Share to us a bit about, a bit about it and how's the, the last few weeks been for you? So I think it's still achieving a PhD is something that you can't really wrap your head around because it's, I don't know, like, because it comes with the title of now being called doctor. And so when people always, when people engage and they're like, hey, Dr. Peters, you're like, who's that? <laughs> then it's like, oh, that's me. Uh, so it comes with a whole mind shift because you go mm. from a miss to now being a doctor, you know, and then you get the title of being an expert. So mm. everybody engages you as, oh, being an expert in your field. So it comes <laughs> with a lot of pressure as well, you know, it's, it's a responsibility um, yeah. that comes with the title. And so it's something that's still, you still process it, you know, um, just only but last year that I got the results and of two weeks ago that I officially graduated. Mm. The last two weeks, I think three weeks have been crazy. Um, I've been, oh, every time I open up my phones or emails and it starts with, hi, Dr. Peters. <laughs> <laughs> then I know it's going to be a request for something, you know, so I've, I've had radio interviews, I've had the, the Department of the Western Cape reach out to me to do talks with, with their uh, social workers on my research, I've had mm. journalists come up writing articles, just yesterday somebody sent me a message and they're like, oh, you're in the paper, and I was like, okay, yeah. <laughs> so, it's, it's, it's been, it's been a next week. I get flown out to Joburg to go and sit on the club um, hey. show. So that's really exciting. Yeah, um, that is super exciting. So it's, 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 it's been very exciting. And I was not expecting the feedback that I received from the public. Mm. So it's been very humbling because with most PhDs, you know, it stays in academia. We have conversations in academia with our journals, books, but it stays in academia. So the fact that the public grasped onto my topic and engaged with my work and I've had people from Manenberg, Lavender Hill all over the Cape Flats engaging mm. with me has been so humbling um, especially when, when when colored men have come out to come and thank me for the work that I've done that has been really humbling for me and so the whole experience has been exciting humbling a completion you know uh, a full 360 moment for me. And so it's just all with so much gratitude. Yeah. And talk to us a bit about, you know, the research that you did and, and why, why do you think there's been such a huge response to it, you know, especially from the communities on the Cape Flats. Talk to us a bit about that. Please. So my work specifically focused on young men living in Bishop Labus. And I looked at how they sort of navigate their spaces how they make sense of what it means to be a man in the Cape Flats mm. and how they are engaging with the narratives around what it means to be a colored man. And so I think why the public grasped onto it was one of the main sort of focuses on my research was talking back against the sort of oversimplified, generalized stereotypes that mm. the media, that the dominant discourses in academia perpetuate about colored men. And mm. this is that if you are if you're a colored man and you're from the Cape Flats, you are going to become a gangster. You are going to be a thief or criminal of sorts. That is your life path, you mm -hmm. know? And I had lived at Bishop Labus and I know the community and my family lived there. And I know I've got cousins who are men and I know those young men are doing so much more. They have not gone into the prison system. They have not become gangsters. And I was like, I want to tell those stories. I want to mm. tell the stories of the, this, these complex young men, this complex community that is always stereotyped as the gangland, as the gangsters. And I wanted to show that these men are so much more. Mm. And so in the research, you know, these men showed that they are fathers, they are entrepreneurs, they are sportsmen, you know, they are so much more 
Um, and, and, and constructing gangsterism is really a waste of time and something that led to, to dead end consequences and something that mm -hmm. they were speaking out against. And so I think for lots of colored men, you know, it was like, thank you, finally, a breath of fresh air. We're tired of always just being seen as the gangsters because we're not. Mm -hmm. And showing that, you know, these stereotypes have real consequences for these young men because lots of them said, they would walk on sea point and people would start, you know, hiding their bags from them or putting away their stuff. And how that really is so humiliating for these young men oh, yeah. and having it. And, and so starting a, a discussion about how stereotypes have real consequences mm. for, for young colored men, yeah. um, you know, and that we need to, we need to start to open up our minds and think about the complexities because you can't just see a colored man and ask them, oh, are you part of the gangs? Like that is very offensive because we are not one homogenous group. We are so many different, like you have so many different types of colored people. You have people yeah. who, who look colored, but don't identify as colored. Um, and so you can't just go and paint us all with the same brush. And so that is what my research was really trying to have a discussion about. Yeah, sure. That's, that's it's, it's quite intense. And I mean, it's quite relevant uh, because uh, about the reason why I started the platform Aspiration Inspiration, you know, is to show people a different side of people on the Cape Flats. The fact that we are mm -hmm. not just, you know, what society portray us to be, like we are more mm -hmm. than just the gangsters or the drug lords or, you know, people mm -hmm. like that are ready to just, you know, to rob you or to, to steal from you. Or, you know, it's, it's mm -hmm. about the stereotypes. Mm -hmm. you know, there are people in the mm -hmm. community that have, or on the Cape Flats in particular, that have gone on to achieve great things. And I think your research is mm -hmm. at this. Yo, it's, uh, it's basically the reason for, for why I also do what I do. And, and thank you so much for, for sharing that and for addressing that. Because mm -hmm. um, as you say, it has real consequences. And, and the fact that mm -hmm. stereotypes are out there, it, it, it becomes perpetuated because now, you know, someone mm -hmm. someone thinks about a colored guy as this guy is incompetent. He's probably just you know he wants to steal, mm -hmm. he wants to, and 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 mm -hmm. influences your your job opportunities and influences exactly, and it sort of pushes mm -hmm. you again into that you know the community where mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. is the drug lord mm -hmm. gang. Or, mm -hmm. you know, so so I think it's critical that we address and and uh, these issues and have these conversations. Um, mm -hmm. Thank mm -hmm. you so much for the work that you've done. Now now. You know, you, you said that you grew up in Bishop Lavers, um, and in one of the articles that I read about you, you said that you had a very uh, colorful life, um, you know, and, and <laughs> I, I, I really appreciated the pun in the article about color <laughs> and saying you have a colorful life. I really appreciate <laughs> that. Um, can you please talk to us a bit about your, your, your colorful life? Share with us a bit of uh, your experiences and how that you mm -hmm. know, come into who you are today. Mm -hmm. So I so I was initially born in Kimberley, and then uh, my parents divorced because I had a I had a very abusive father, um, and he abused alcohol a lot. And so eventually, my mother ran away, and she left with basically nothing but her children. And we moved then to Cape Town, and my mom my mom's family is based in in Bishop Labour, so that's where she grew up. That's where her mother is. That's where her family is. And so we moved to Bishop Lavis and my granny's house was filled with her other children, which is normal of, of, of colored homes on the Cape Flats. And so we then set up a Wendy house at the back of my granny's house. And that's where we lived for um, so a year or two before I started grade one and my mom then got relocated to a police flat. So my mother's a police officer. Mm -hmm. um, and so in that, and so in moving, we always came back. So after school, I'd go back to my granny's house. On the weekend, I'd be in Bishop Labors in my granny's house. So I practically lived in Bishop Labors. I just wasn't sleeping there. Um, but living in Bishop Labors, why I said it was so colorful was my memories of it is, is, is one of, you know, going outside and getting my friends. And we used to play marble. So we had this game where you'd make like a hole in the ground and you throw the marbles in and then you'd you know, see who could get the marble in and then you'd shoot it closer. And sometimes there'd be prize money. Sometimes they wouldn't, you know, um, skipping in the road with the children. Um, one of my fondest memories was, so my granny used to have a yacht next to a house. 
you know, yacht, like the mm -hmm. disco vibes, you know, where you go and socialize and so forth. So it was a way for my uncle at the time was, was unemployed. And so it was a way for him to start. It was a business, basically, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. And you don't see it as entrepreneurship, but at that time it was entrepreneurship, you know, it was yeah, making yeah. money. Um, and so it was at my granny's home sort of became the center where lots of the community would come. And if people were drinking too much, you know, my uncle would take them home and make sure they're safe and so forth. So I used to love going there because it was the yeah. place where I could learn all the newest dance moves. Hey. So I was, yeah, I was like the dancing queen of the yacht. So I used to go there. And I used to dance my socks off and all yeah. the different characters would come and they would teach me, this is the new dance in military, <laughs> Dika work in Dika sit. <laughs> so I, I used to, that's why I said it was so colorful. And I remember there was a, we, I, in grade R, there was a dancing play and there was a freestyle moment where we had to freestyle and everybody's just doing a two-step, but Simone came with all of her yacht. <laughs> And my mom was like, uh, my mom uh, was like, yeah, you can see you are yacht child. Yeah. I, I just, I absolutely loved it there, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and I remember being chased when we were naughty. My grandfather would chase us through the whole of Bishop Labors. And then he would get all his friends. And you know, on the Cape Plus, like everybody gets a nickname. So my uh, grandfather had friends who were two and not chasing us. <laughs> and I are chasing us. Uh, so you know, uh, that, that sort of very colorful all the characters mm. i mean my family's tall so all of us got the name of langer mm. um, and i remember when i walked to the shops and it's like oh langer oh langer and i'm like that's not me it's my uncle uh, you know uh, and so that that sort of that sort of color um was not something that was being portrayed in the mm. media you know when the media talks about um bishop labors or places like the cape flats all they talk about is that it's gangland, it's dangerous. And I knew it as a place that was home. It is a place mm -hmm. where I had learned so much resilience. I had learned so much about community, about love, because there was so much community. I mean, my granny knows everybody in the street. When we walk, everybody's like, Ow, Hannah, who's it, Hannah? you know, how's mm -hmm. everybody? And they can name all my granny's children by name, the mm -hmm. grandkids by name, you know? And I was like, that is, that is wonderful because it's people who are actually invested in your life, you know. And when I did the work in the community, I mean, there was nobody telling me I can't come into their houses. People were like, come in. How's the work going, um, Simone? What you need from us, you know. Um, so people were open, like they opened up their houses to me, opened up their doors to me. And when I asked like the children in the streets, because I did a photo voice project, so it was a lot of pictures. When mm. I asked them, can I take pictures of you? They were like, yes, yes, yes. What you want to take? No, we can show you this. Because I would see boys who would be who would make kites and they're flying mm. their kites or they would build scooters. And I wanted to show that because yes, they don't have the resources, but these boys and these young girls are not just sitting back. They are becoming resourceful. I mean, when I saw mm. these boys building scooters, I was like, wow, this is like, that just blew my mind. And these scooters were pretty, it was pretty awesome. They yeah. built these wooden scooters that they got like these wood pieces, you know. And so I wanted to show really the resilience of this community, mm. despite all of the challenges. I mean, Bishop Labors does come with challenges. I have I have experienced crime myself. I've had um, gangsters come into my grandparents' home and and hold and hold us at gunpoint, you know. Um, mm -hmm. And so I know that side of the community. And despite those challenges, you know, the community members negotiate that space, and they still go and create community, and they still go and create all this love. And so wanting to really show the complexity of this community. Um, and yeah, so growing up in Bishop Labors and going back to that community has, has taught me so much about myself, has yeah. taught me so much resilience. I mean, talking to my grandparents and listening to how they overcame an apartheid regime, how they went on to go raise their children in this community, um, mm -hmm. how... You know, my granny said, you know, none of her children went into gangsterism, went into drugs, and they lived off like nothing. My granny and my, my family lived in poverty. And despite that, you know, um, making something of themselves. And, and that was really, like, it was really inspiring to me. And it showed me that despite all of this, despite my circumstances, 
I can go on to go and achieve greatness and having them behind me 100% has been mm. so amazing. You know, that's really encouraged me to be the woman that I am. I mean, I had a mother that was like all about the education. Um, she was like, you know, we don't have money and I'm going to do my best, but I want you to go and do your best. I want you to go and achieve. And so going back to them with a the PhD was so emotional because my granny was like, never in her wildest dreams did she ever think that any of her children or grandchildren would go and achieve a PhD. And so when I walk, as I went back to Bishop Labus in my red garden, in my cap, and I watched my graduation there. And seeing the community all come to congratulate me, my grandmother was in tears. Oh, it was so much tears. <laughs> it was so much crying. It was that of emotional, you know, emotional tears. And everybody just sort of saying that, you know, thank you so much because mm. I've not only inspired other people, but first and foremost, I inspired my younger cousins who are still living in Bishop Labus um, and inspiring them to say, you know, we are not our circumstances. Yeah. Because I always tell people, I came, I lived in a Wendy house and now I have a PhD. Um, mm. So if I can do that, you know, it's not impossible. And it's not like I had a silver spoon in my mouth. My mother was a single parent of four children. Um, mm. Life was not easy. It was, it was very tough. But despite all of that, you know, Hard work, persistence, and perseverance is 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 something that all of us have in us, and we mm. have the ability to go and achieve. You know. Yeah. Thank you so much for that, uh, and for sharing, you know, some of these things that are not always portrayed in media about in the media about mm. the flats, you know, about some of our communities, our sense of community, mm. and and that sense mm. of you know love and that sense of belonging that you do have, you know, beyond mm. the gangs, beyond. Mm you know, the, the socioeconomic issues um, that we face mm. on a daily basis. Um, mm. so, so thank you so much for sharing that part. And then obviously leading to you becoming a PhD holder, you know, all of those people I'm sure had a hand in where you are today. And um, even going back to the community with your red gown, you know, being proud and they, them being able to experience that with you um, mm. Mm. as well. Um, so, Dr. Peters, going into going into Women's Month coming up, um, you know, and I know the conversation is going to be largely around that. Um, what, how can you, what, how would you describe, you know, the the, or how do you see um, how important is woman empowerment for you um, in mm -hmm. at the moment, particularly, you know, women that you know grow up um, in environments that that maybe you grew up in. Um, mm. you know, how important is the empowerment um, and, and, and mm. thinking about um, the situation we currently face in South Africa? Mm -mm. So woman empowerment is something that is very important to me. Um, and it's so with me, my own sort of platform, I think so. my motto is empowered woman, empower woman, you know, mm -hmm. instead of breaking other women down. So it's how do we use our platforms to inspire and empower other women? And so some of my platforms, so I'm a netball player and I'm also subsequently a netball coach. So I've used netball as a platform to inspire and, and, and empower young girls. So I've worked on, in Kailicha, in Manenberg. I've worked with girls all over the southern suburbs. Mm. Um, and, and I've also mentored young girls in Bishop Lavis because, you know, the statistics with, with young girls of color, particularly colored girls, is that there's a tendency for them or the stereotype that we fall pregnant mm. at under the age of 20, you know, and then we end up dropping out of school. And so we never do make it up the ladders of education. And so I think, so for me, I use my platform to go back to those young girls and say, you know, you can go and achieve. So if you need help to get into your university space, let me know, let's look for bursaries, let's look for opportunities, you know, inspire them with my stories, and so it's very humbling for me when I get young girls who are like, no, Simone, I'm now in my first year at Stellenbosch. I'm in my mm -hmm. first year at UWC. I have one of my girls who I mentored who just recently finished the master's at UCT. And so really just using my platform to empower young girls, be it in their sports like netball, because I think sometimes sports is a great platform. It's, it's very easy going you know girls look up to you and so it becomes a space for us to just have conversations what it's like to be a woman in south africa um, all of the challenges we face and how do we negotiate this and just having sort of the big sister to talk to 
which I've become to so many girls. Um, and being a psychologist, you also have girls telling me about, you know, home issues and, and the things that they're facing and just giving them some tools to navigate that um, yeah. has been something that's very important to me. And I think it's something that if women are women, in, especially a woman in color, because, you know, it's all about representation. We yeah. are so little in, in, in spaces of influence. And mm. so it's so important that we go back and we show young girls within our communities that they are capable of so much more. Mm. They are capable of achieving so much more and really giving them actual tools because it's all okay for us to give talks and chats, but you know, lots of these girls don't even know where to start. Mm. You know, where do I start? How do I enter university spaces? How do I enter the college spaces? And so just giving that time, you know, even if it's an hour in the week to just sit with them and say, you know, here are the resources or how can I help you reach out to me? Mm. I am here, you know, I know time is very valuable to people, but I mean, it's that, that little bit extra that we can do mm. um, that can make, that can make the biggest impact in, in, in people's lives. And so, that is sort of my small contribution. I'm hoping to do so much more um, once COVID just calms down and I have mm. access and, and, and the, yeah, and I have access to, to go and do more because I think there's mm. so much more that needs to be done. I haven't even like tapped even 1%, you know? <laughs> um, and so it, it's just doing that extra bit of work, you know, going, if we have the, the platforms, going into schools, going mm. to talk to the young people, mentoring them, you know, I've, I've been on camps where I went in and, and gave, you know, we give tools and practical tips to young children. Um, and so just doing those little things to empower people. And, and really, you don't know the influence you have. I mean, with my PhD and getting all the feedback and then getting the DMs and the messages and having all these young women tell me, you know, it's, it's been so refreshing seeing a black woman excel, seeing a colored woman excel, you know, seeing me do it, it's giving them hope and it's empowering them. And so for me, that's been so encouraging because mm -hmm. you never know what your story is doing, you know, mm -hmm. and you never know um, who your story is, 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 is enriching and, and what it's doing, you know, and I think it's yeah. it's really important that that we strive to keep on empowering people and use our platforms to do that, yeah. especially if people are looking up to us, you know. Yeah, very very important. And thank you for sharing that. And and talking about you know empowering and um, talking about your story, how what does it take, you know, um, being where you are from, and you know obtaining a PhD. Um, talk to us a bit about the process. Just what does it take to obtain a PhD? So in terms of the, the process, I mean, you, you, get your, you get your matric, you get your undergrad, which is three years, you get an honors, that's a year, two years masters, and then you get your PhD, which you normally do in three years. Average person does the PhD between four or five years, I went on to go and do my PhD in two years and six months. Ooh. So even in that journey, <laughs> even in that journey, I defied the odds. Yeah. Um, I, I, I think so for me to get to the PhD, I think it, it was, I'm not going to say it was an easy journey because it came with a lot of challenges in itself. I mean, I had, I'd gone into a, a white I. I was in a colored school as in a pri and primary level. At high school, I got a scholarship to go to a white, a predominantly white school. Um, and that was the first time I felt, I felt so inferior. I felt so poor. I felt so colored, you know, um, and having to deal really with, was feeling like I just didn't measure up mm. because everybody spoke differently to me. Um, people were driving fancy cars their parents were the ceos these doctors and, and so forth and having to really battle with feeling inferior and feeling you know and it was a feeling that i'd never felt before because i'd been surrounded by people who looked like me people who had all been poor like me we all came with our peanut butter and jam sandwiches you know and now coming to a school where people were having ham and chicken sandwiches <clears throat> and you coming with your peanut butter sandwiches you know um <laughs> And so really having to adjust your mind. And I mean, 
I did not grieve for my mother at that time because I went home crying every day and I told my mother, take me out and put me in a, in a, like a, a predominantly colored school because I mm. hated feeling like an outsider at my high school. Um, mm. And then, you know, being asked, you know, Simone, um, don't you want to say JJJ? You know, this was how you colored people talk, you know, or having oh. people like run away from me because they were scared of me, you know. Mm. Um, and I always used to make this joke that I used to be the Moses of, of, of high school because whenever I used to walk, people would part the seat so that I could walk <laughs> through. Um, yeah. And um, and so like that experience had, had really, you know, there was there was that thing of like mm. that now having to adjust. Um, but my mom used to always tell me like, she was like, Simone, no one can make you feel inferior without your consent. You are at the school just like these girls. You, oh, you got a scholarship, so you belong here. You've got what it takes, so you go and use this education and you go make your, you go make something of yourself, you know? And hearing my mm. mother say that, because my mother's like, I'm not taking out of the school. This is a good school and you are going to, like, you are going to stay here, you know? My mm. mom said, life is tough. You can't just quit at any time. You're going to have to persevere and push through, you know? Mm. Um, and that sort of set me up for my life at UCT because UCT also predominantly white space. Um, as a black student, you're always getting questioned, you know, especially as you go up in the levels um, mm. and you're going to your honors and your, and your masters, you're going to get questioned. Are you a BEE sort of uh, let in? Did you get your unmerit or because of your color, mm. you know? And so you're always going to get that where people are doubting you or you, uh, I was most of the time, you know, the only person of color um, in a predominantly white space and always having to defend your position, always having to defend why you belong here, you know. One girl even said, oh, Simone, you know, I'm so scared of you. And I'm like, how can you be scared of me? Like, you know, and, and, and having that, that your, your race, yeah, your race is always that, there's always stereotypes with your race. Mm. Um, so I wasn't scared because of who I was. I was scared because I was colored. That's why I was scared, to, you know, and so having to battle with that, but but having my mom's words echo that I can't, I give people consent to make me feel inferior, um, that I need to, this is a journey and I need to persevere, life is tough and I need mm -hmm. to push through and having those words echo in my mind whenever I was hit with those challenges, because there were moments where I was like, you know, what, screw these people. I'm just done. I'm just tired, you know, and um, really having great supervisors. I had chosen supervisors of color. So my supervisor, Floretta Bonzaya, so she was from Mitchell's Plain originally. And mm. so having somebody on the Cape Flats and she wow. had gone up to go and be a professor. So I was seeing through the presentation every day and I used to, like when I sat in the office and I said, you know, there's so much racism that I experienced in class. And she was like, you know, Simone, it's part of the journey, but you need to push through. You have what it takes. And just having her speak so much life into me made me see like, if she sees that, I, I need to see that in myself too. And then later on, having my second supervisor, Shose Kesi, come on and just having them to mentor me, give me guidance. I mean, when it came to funding, they would find money for me. Mm. Um, I mean, Shosei let me fly with her to Belgium to go and have conversations. When it was conferences, they would get me onto the panels to have a conversation with other people. So having strong supervisors and strong mentors and a strong support system was really pinnacle for me getting to this place. You know, I had I had people in my life who were not backing down, who were telling mm. me, Simone, I believe in you. I know that you can do this. You are not just a person for honors. You need to go and get your PhD. And then they would hold the, did you apply for your PhD? Did you apply for your PhD? Did you apply, <laughs> you know? Um, and so I'm, I'm really grateful to the, 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 the massive um, support system I had at this time because it really helped. And then, of course, you know, having people praying for me and, and having God by my side, you know, um, God has really been my strength through every journey in my life. Um, mm -hmm. I've seen the favor of the Lord. I've seen the grace of God and having my prayer warriors constantly interceding for me, praying mm -hmm. for me, I think has also been so immense. Um, I, I know for the fact I would be nowhere if it had not been for God. And so really all of the glory and praise goes to God. Um, Cause I think, you know, He's the one that ordains my footsteps and he's the one who opens up the doors for me going forward. And so that is also my, my faith has really grounded me in the journey. 
um, and really just kept me going when, you know, there's been moments of doubt and moments of fear and always just reciting Jeremiah 29 verse 11 over my life, um, which was a verse I got when, when I was saved and just reciting that over my life and knowing that, you know, God has plans to prosper me and not to harm me. So those have been sort of the sort of mm. pillars that have helped me on to getting to this journey because it came with a lot of sweat, a lot of tears, a lot of feeling like oh, I don't belong, feeling like an mm. imposter, you know, feeling like what the hell am I doing? But knowing that I'm not just doing this PhD for me, I'm doing this PhD for every little boy and girl in the Cape Flats that dreams of something but believes it's not like, it believes no. it won't ever come through and showing them that whatever we dream and we believe, we it becomes our reality. Yeah. Um, and for every person on Bishop Labors who gave their time for me and gave the effort, this PhD was for them. It was, it was a sort of a, a, a memoir of their narratives and of their complexities, you know, mm -hmm. um, and doing it for them as well and, and pushing through for them as well. And of course, doing it for my siblings who I'm the eldest of my siblings. And so my siblings have always looked up to me and doing this also to show them that the sky is the limit because mm -hmm. we, we, live, we live the same lives practically. Um, and if I can do this, you can do this too. And, and so, yeah, um, this was yeah a lot <laughs> yeah thank you so much for sharing all of that and with that i think you know it's an apt point to to conclude our conversation there's indeed a lot to talk about um and i'm sure that you're going to be talking you know to many many more people and you'll be reading ma many many more articles and um looking forward to the rest of your interviews on club and you know I, I saw that there was articles coming in care and all these wonderful opportunities coming for you and you know, may they continue to come and may you continue to grow um, in your career um, as a professional um, and may you continue to shine that light for the, for the Cape Flats and for, you know, for, for, for the communities that are, you know, often stereotyped and, um, and also for yourself, you know, um, and for your legacy that you leave behind, you know, all of the best with your journey. Um, thank you so much for speaking to us on Aspiration Inspiration today. Thank you so much, Jason. All right. Thank you. And with that, we conclude. Thank you so much for joining us again here on Aspiration Inspiration. As always, we aspire to inspire before we expire. Thank you. <laughs>